Are you ready, David? I am, yeah. Okay. Well, good morning. Um, good morning to everyone and welcome to the second in a series of four uh, conversations about uh, race and Baltimore and Johns Hopkins. Uh, this is uh, going to be uh, a series that's done on Monday mornings this month. Uh, our guest today is David Taft Terry, who's an associate professor of history at Morgan State University. I've gotten to know Dr. Terry uh, through a couple of conversations over the last several months, and he has enlightened me tremendously about the history of Baltimore and Maryland. He is a true historian, something that we in medicine actually, I think, need more of. Uh, David Taft Terry's research interests include 19th and 20th century U.S. civil history with a particular focus on Black life in the South. Uh, he has a number of publications and a number of books. His most recent publication is The Struggle and the Urban South, Confronting Jim Crow in Baltimore Before the Movement. Uh, before joining Morgan State's faculty, where he's an associate professor, Dr. Terry was executive director at the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of African American History, uh, which if you have not been there, is a true gem. Uh, he earned a BA from the University of Maryland and holds a doctorate from Howard University and uh, lives in Prince George's County. Did you grow up at all in Baltimore, David? Uh, I guess it depends on how you define grow up. I I see. A, I've been in Baltimore for the better part of 20 years professionally. That's great. Well, thank you and uh, uh, welcome and we appreciate your talk. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, uh, the hospital for uh, putting this together. I think it's a wonderful and timely uh, program and I'm happy to participate. So um, what I wanted to talk about this morning um, I, I try to keep as much as is possible uh, my historical conversations uh, relative to contemporary events and uh, much of what we have been dealing with beyond uh, our struggles with the coronavirus pandemic is this sort of reckoning that we tend to come to as a society uh, uh, a few times every generation it seems and in particular the uh, circumstances that have developed and Americans quite literally taking to the streets in protest of a wide variety of uh, subjects related to uh, racial justice and social justice for our African Americans, uh, particularly as flowed out of the uh, murder of George Floyd earlier this year. Uh, a corollary to that has been the notion or the conversations around the notion of allies. Uh, those who, uh, in, in this instance, uh, regarding African Americans, those who have come to stand with and stand beside and support uh, the African American struggle. Uh, this, this notion of allies has an historical context, and I thought I might pull together just some thoughts on uh, how this uh, history of uh, alliances with the Black struggle came together. Um, one thing that I think is uh, 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 worth pointing out is the idea uh, that uh, the African American struggle is much older, much longer, has a much longer historical arc than what we generally associate as the civil rights movement, the period of the late 50s through the mid 1960s, when a wide variety of uh, 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 aspects of American society uh, came to recognize uh, uh, the Black uh, struggle and uh, took steps, especially legislatively, uh, to address some of its grievances. Uh, at no point, however, should we assume that uh, African-Americans uh, were not in struggle, were not uh, 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 pushed to correct their own uh, uh, challenges, uh, whether others stood with them or not. So the, the discussion of allies is not necessarily about other people leading Blacks to freedom, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but it is important to recognize that the presence of allies, uh, particularly the different types of resources allies can bring, can often make the difference uh, as to whether or not uh, Blacks in this case, or really any other marginalized group, uh, uh, the, the types of uh, 
uh, strategies, the types of tactics they can deploy, the types of goals perhaps they can set for their struggle often depends on their visibility and the participation, the acknowledgement uh, of their struggle. So what I'd like to do is just take a broad look at how allies have come to support the African-American struggle in the South sort of writ large, but to draw examples from Baltimore uh, as much as is possible. Uh, in my uh, research uh, and certainly in my most recent book, um, uh, I cast Baltimore as an example of a Southern city looking at the notion or looking at the idea of how uh, the urban environment, urbanicity impacts uh, the way in which the struggle unfolded in the 20th century. So before we can understand the sort of struggle, I thought it was necessary for us to deal with a few elements of what was being struggled against, what the sort of challenge was. And that is the presence of the ideology and the manifestations of that ideology uh, that we refer to as white supremacy. Um, even after slavery, uh, obviously, white supremacy was and has been an organizing premise uh, uh, in many ways to the way in which American society uh, is structured. Um, we tend to think of white supremacy in only its sort of bald-faced, uh, virulent, uh, overly visible and antagonistic uh, manifestations. Uh, but uh, white supremacy, uh, uh, particularly early in the 20th century, uh, quite literally shaped every fabric, uh, every aspect of American life, and particularly the way in which African Americans uh, related to or interacted with aspects of American life and with other Americans. Uh, it was an, an historical force and uh, our ability to sort of grasp how it, uh, how it impacted Black life uh, at all levels and in, in, in every way is sort of uh, central to us really appreciating the ways in which Blacks therefore resisted and worked uh, to overcome white supremacy. Uh, white supremacy was not about uh, what it presented itself as, this notion of Black inferiority, to sort of look at it in reverse. Uh, in fact, uh, Jim Crow, which was in the South, the codification of white supremacy, the codification of white uh, privilege as protected by law was not so much aimed at uh, Blacks who lacked educational or, or, or other sorts of resources to better themselves. In fact, white supremacy was uh, originally, particularly in the urban environment, aimed at Blacks who were deemed most competitive, right? Uh, we look at the ways in which these laws uh, were developed, we look at the way in which the culture around white supremacy sort of manifest itself, and we can find every example of that. Uh, here in Baltimore in the 1910s, uh, 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 creating uh, something that the rest of the country very soon uh, followed uh, in, in Baltimore's footsteps, uh, was the idea of segregating residential areas by block, uh, quite literally, which race could live on which block block by block throughout the city. Uh, George W.F. McMechan, you'll see his picture at, at, at some point uh, in this presentation, was uh, I believe a Yale trained lawyer who rented a house in a well-to-do neighborhood and his neighbors not wanting him uh, there uh, lobbied to create a city ordinance, a city law uh, that would ban blacks from uh, uh, living where whites did not want them to live. Uh, this had nothing to do with his, uh, his comportment or his cultural refinement or his education. This was about his Blackness and his Blackness alone. Uh, Joe Gans is another example. Uh, and, and but many of these examples come from uh, issues that I deal with uh, in my book. Uh, so if I'm moving quickly through these his historical examples, there are ways in which you might learn more. But suffice to say, Joe Gans was the first African-American in the sport of boxing to win a recognized world championship. He was a Baltimorean. And 
his interactions with other Baltimoreans, particularly white Baltimoreans, tell us much about how white supremacy uh, sort of morphed the psychology of how others perceived him uh, when he was just on the street and people weren't aware of who he was. You know, he was subjected to all sorts of mistreatments and uh, incidences of police brutality and uh, uh, disrespected and discarded. When he was Joe Gann's world champion, however, uh, white, uh, his white friends and colleagues and fans described him in ways that went through loops to excuse his blackness or strip him of his blackness. Many have described or at least remember him with descriptions that referred to him as the whitest black man they had ever known, if only because of his ability to win a championship, which somehow perverted uh, their perceptions of racial order. So white supremacy as an institutional and organizational uh, uh, way in which Blacks had to move uh, in, in Baltimore, uh, in the South, and at this point in time, the early 20th century, in much of America uh, where they lived uh, was an important way or an, an important factor to consider. Uh, Surprisingly, perhaps, white supremacy also guided uh, what in the early 20th century uh, uh, passed for liberalism. Uh, 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 white supremacy also guided the way in which Southern liberals worked to improve conditions for African Americans, uh, such as they were. Uh, the chief difference between what we might call Southern liberalism at the turn of the 20th century and other sort of ideological approaches to race relations were that uh, the Southern liberals were put off, were disgusted quite sincerely by the brutality of lynching, by the uh, prevalence of race riots in, in, uh, in which uh, white mobs uh, destroyed black life, black property. Uh, they looked, these Southern liberals looked for ways to ameliorate the violence uh, both out of a sort of moral uh, moral impetus, but also uh, many of these southern liberals were interested in uh, the South's image before the rest of the country and, and interested uh, to put the best sort of Southern face forward to potential economic investors and the like. Uh, so we see in the early 20th century a prol proliferation of what were known as interracial committees, both in terms of uh, public uh, uh, organization, the state of Maryland, for example, organized an interracial committee in the early 1920s and most other Southern and many non-Southern uh, governments did the same. But there was also the work of private uh, entities like the uh, Commission on Interracial Cooperation. So on its face and at first blush, um, these organizations worked to ameliorate the social and material, pardon me, the material uh, aspects of Black life without necessarily, without quite pointedly disturbing their social realities. Uh, these uh, interracialist organizations, or at least uh, the white leadership and membership of these organizations were quite admittedly, quite openly pro-segregation, pro-Jim Crow. Their point was not to remove the social distance between whites and Blacks, but to find some way within that structure to improve uh, Black material life, Black material um, uh, aspects. They were for the equitable preservation of Jim Crow. Uh, and therefore, as Blacks look at these uh, groups as allies, as Blacks look to these groups uh, for their worth in helping to provide uh, what Blacks needed at the time, uh, Blacks had to take a pragmatic approach. Uh, there was only so much that could be possible uh, in working with groups who had that sort of orientation. With the unchallenged uh, position uh, that Jim Crow as a philosophy, as a, an ordering uh, mechanism in Southern society uh, occupied, there was only so much, again, African-Americans might expect. So when at the beginning of the 20th century and through the first two or three decades, we see black resistance geared as much toward building its community, 
sort of building that nation within the nation. You know, we shouldn't mistake that as a disinterest by African Americans in uh, something more, a disinterest in desegregation. It, it's rather quite pragmatically uh, reading the room and understanding what is possible uh, for a minority group, a group that uh, is economically disadvantaged, a group that is by design politically ostracized and marginalized, uh, and a group who has no allies to be seen, or at least very few of them who are interested in anything uh, like uh, the sharing of a society uh, uh, in a fair and equal sort of manner. So Black life in the early 20th century, and certainly here in Baltimore, uh, moves to create institutions and organizations uh, that will help uh, them achieve what the rest of the society might deny them, while at the same time continually exploring and pressing against the obstacles, both material and uh, uh, in terms of uh, the philosophy of segregation, the philosophy of Jim Crow. Uh, so we see this sort of dual uh, approach to resistance uh, dominating uh, in much of the early 20th century. If it, uh, Otis, if it seems I'm going a little too long, please nudge me along so I, I can talk. So, <laughs> um, Suffice it to say, uh, and here, by the way, is a picture of George W. F. McMekin. Uh, suffice it to say, the proliferation of the types of structures, uh, 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 both the sort of spoken ideology and professed ideology, but also the way in which that ideology informs policy making, informs laws. Uh, at every turn is resisted, but also at every turn is understood uh, by African Americans pragmatically as the circumstances with which they have to, to deal. So in the wake of those residential segregation laws, for example, while African Americans certainly press for greater residential space, you know, Baltimore had some of the most horrific population densities uh, uh, in, in the nation in terms of its African-American uh, community. And uh, for those of you who are in the public health field, it is not a surprise that uh, Baltimore uh, was a hot spot for tuberculosis, for example, uh, for so many decades uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century in its black neighborhoods because they were quite literally forced by custom and ultimately by law to live on top of each other. Uh, without appropriate sanitation. Uh, add to that the attempts to disfranchise, to take black, the vote away from black men uh, at the time and ultimately uh, failed, but not failed for want of trying. Uh, uh, African-Americans understood that what the opportunities, the opportunities that were available to them would be limited uh, and would stop just short of defying uh, anything uh, associated with white privileging or, or white supremacy, and that Jim Crow would be a fact of life. Uh, and uh, ultimately, uh, efforts to push against that while uh, maintained were never, uh, were never without sort of corollary efforts to build what they needed in spite of, uh, uh, in spite of uh, what Jim Crow uh, might otherwise deny them. The alliances that were open did have benefits that could be taken advantage of, however, and to call them benefits uh, should not suggest that they were purposefully uh, intended this way. Um, one of the uh, principal resistance strategies, for example, was a notion of organization uh, that uh, might nurture a self-reliance, might nurture a collective uh, action profile, uh, even if and even if largely uh, they were organized by and for African Americans. The uh, NAACP, for example, uh, is an interesting study in this dynamic. Uh, in, in most histories, the NAACP is seen and viewed and judged uh, from a, a top-down sort of perspective, which is to say people look, and, and largely because of the records that are available, uh, 
and the way in which the research might be conducted, or at least until this point, because uh, those circumstances as well are changing, people would look at the New York office and people would see uh, the National Board of Directors, which was prominent uh, with important and powerful uh, white Americans. Uh, they would look at the organization of the NAACP itself organized when it was in 1909 uh, by a majority uh, white group. And they would then uh, assume that what the NAACP was at the national level, so too was it at its local branch level. Uh, if you're not familiar with the NAACP, particularly in its first 50 years, there was a national organization in headquartered in New York uh, uh, in the last 30 years or so uh, here in Baltimore or in there in Baltimore. But uh, prior to 1960, uh, there was the New York headquarters, but the true strength of the NAACP, at least in terms of its fundraising, how it got its money and its actual advocacy, the feet on the ground doing the work were in the quite literally the thousands of branches uh, that were in neighborhoods and communities across the South and across the nation. And for a good deal of that, those years, Baltimore was one of the largest and one of the most influential branches. Uh, and more so, uh, especially in the South, uh, the NAACP was an all black concern. The branches were run by blacks, the directors uh, and boards of directors and trustees, uh, the uh, executive staff, the volunteers, the field workers, these were African-Americans themselves uh, who were working to uh, implement local programs, local policies uh, that jived in many ways with national directives, but particularly for the more powerful branches like Baltimore, uh, where the national directories, directives rather, uh, uh, broke with the local needs, there was always a compensation, if not an out and out confrontation uh, between uh, in terms of what local needs uh, and national policy uh, uh, where they contended. Uh, Baltimore's uh, community could support something uh, like the Baltimore NAACP, but also the Baltimore UNIA, Marcus Garvey's outfit, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Uh, all of these were uh, aspects of the types of community building and institution building uh, that were taking place in the early 20th century when white supremacy and even among, again, the liberal ranks narrowed uh, the uh, access that Blacks had to uh, allies uh, outside of their own community. Uh, one of the chief uh, aspects of why this community that Baltimore built and Baltimore's is representative of quite literally dozens of other communities across the South, especially in the largest cities. But one of the chief sort of pillars of that strength was an active and crusading local black press here in Baltimore uh, in between the late 19th and early 20th century. There were quite literally dozens of black run newspapers at any given moment. Uh, the Baltimore Afro-American, which is still publishing today, however, emerged in the 1890s as the strongest voice. And the leadership of that newspaper, particularly uh, Carl Murphy, whose picture you see there, helped to uh, provide a consistent, pragmatic voice, both for the newspaper editorially, but also for the causes that the newspaper took up uh, the Black struggle generally and work with the Baltimore NAACP uh, specifically. Okay. One of the things that historians are concerned with uh, in our research are the sort of uh, changes over time that are carrying, that the sort of breaking points when we can recognize that what was before was in some fundamental way different than what came after. And um, one such point in time as it relates to the African-American struggle generally, but the African-American struggle with regard to the allies uh, it was able to attract to its cause comes in the 1930s and the wartime 1940s. We see a shift 
an evolution, if you will, in American liberalism. And that evolution resonated even in the South. So we point to the 1930s as an opportunity which was taken advantage of in which uh, different alliances, different allies, different voices and resources, sources of, uh, sources of support could be brought to the black cause. Um, this is largely the result of uh, the ways in which the economic emergency and then the war emergency uh, uh, unsettled the field, uh, created the need for allies on, on all fronts. Every walk of American life uh, was unsettled and looking to reestablish uh, some forward momentum. Um, the way in which African Americans perceived this opportunity allowed them to instigate uh, uh, confrontations, if you will, and we see this played out through the remainder of the 20th century, but we see the locus of this energy really starting in the 1930s. The notion that uh, the powers of conservatism, uh, particularly racially, racial conservatism, uh, might be set against or might be made to be confronted, not by Blacks themselves who, uh, in, for most of this period, uh, may have uh, lacked uh, conventional political power, conventional uh, economic power, certainly commensurate with the power of the state uh, that the Jim Crow forces could bring, but that these sort of uh, confrontations uh, could be uh, set against sort of uh, Jim Crow and uh, Blacks with the alliances of uh, a new, form, new forms of liberalism as they are emerging uh, in the 1930s. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we see, for example, uh, allies coming from the left, uh, the communists, the socialists, uh, and other sort of uh, reformers, particularly in the field of labor, uh, the New Deal agencies, which are coming online after the inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1933, uh, are all looking, perhaps not directly to change Black life in the South, but understanding that taking that position or uh, allowing for conversations uh, toward those ends to uh, come to the center or come to a visibility that they had not before uh, would be beneficial to the overall cause, but also would represent unprecedented breaks uh, with uh, the history uh, in the region to that point. What ultimately we see with the remaking of liberalism and its uh, Southern iterations is the old forms of Southern liberalism, the sort of white supremacy liberalism lost its veneer, lost its veneer of legitimacy. Um, throughout this time period, uh, developments are occurring that simply would not, could not have happened only 20 years before. Uh, uh, during the New Deal years, for example, we see the first, uh, the first attempts, the first cracks, if you will, uh, in Jim Crow as far as education is concerned. And that too has Baltimore roots. Uh, many of you are familiar with the story, but for those of you who are not, uh, the NAACP's legal campaign for uh, desegregated education to get rid of Jim Crow in schools begins at the graduate and professional school level. Uh, begins in law schools and begins uh, uh, here, uh, there in Baltimore with the uh, University of Maryland School of Law, uh, creating a template that is uh, ultimately refined and developed and uh, applied throughout the rest of the South for the remainder of the 1930s and 1940s before ultimately evolving into a direct confrontation of Jim Crow uh, and the ultimate triumph of Brown versus the Board of Education, which we'll uh, talk about in just a few minutes. But we also see similar attacks, similar challenges, again, which are made possible because of new positions made possible in many ways because of new tasks that are taken uh, by uh, the e evolutions of liberalism that are occurring in the 30s and 40s that uh, simply would not have been possible before. One of the principal ways, for example, 
that the Southern states especially had stripped Blacks of the right to vote. Again, although uh, Maryland did not yet try, but th those that were successful, one of the ways in which they were able to do this was what was known as the white only primary. Essentially early in the 20th century, uh, uh, the Democrat party, uh, which was the uh, sole, sole party in the South in terms of significant membership and its ability to win elections, the Democrat party uh, held itself as a private organization and therefore reserved as a private organization the right to set its membership and the right to determine uh, uh, its party who participated in its party functions like primary elections. And since primary elections produce the de facto winner of general elections by disallowing blacks to participate uh, for decades, uh, they were able to keep blacks essentially politically neutered. Well, by 1944, the US Supreme Court was in a position where it was ready to strike down the constitutionality of white only primaries. And although the momentum was slow and building, uh, we began to see in the South, especially in its largest cities like Baltimore uh, and others, we see the first sort of uh, uh, uses to this new, that this new political power uh, or potential political power is being put. And we see tremendous uh, organization around voter education and voter registration, and also the notion that uh, Blacks themselves might be courted by political officials. Uh, so we begin to see, again, the foundation laid uh, for later successes uh, in the 1930s and 1940s because of different tacts that are taken uh, with regard to the, uh, uh, the evolutions of, of, of liberalism. In general, what we uh, see is this coalition coming together, uh, uh, the sort of uh, American popular front, if you will, of all of these different ideological groups who are interested in transforming uh, the society to better meet at first the emergencies of the Great Depression and then ultimately to uh, muster uh, the necessary resources to fight the world war and to ideologically defeat fascism, the hypocrisy of anti-fascist uh, uh, anti -fascist pronouncements uh, as the American uh, fighting forces are put to the field in World War II when uh, clear and easily uh, identified uh, analogies between uh, fascism in Europe and fascism in Mississippi were clear to see, uh, began to ideologically build the space for African Americans to make moral demands in ways that they simply could not a generation before when, uh, when their opponents uh, even when their allies denied that those uh, synergies exist. One element of this new liberalism, um, as I suggested, uh, was the ways in which uh, it not simply created opportunities for alliance, but also created opportunities for participation and created, created opportunities for sort of joint action. Uh, in the slide here, you see a picture of Clarence Mitchell, who we know more famously as an attorney uh, and as uh, the head of the Washington Bureau of the NAACP, though he is from uh, an important uh, Baltimore family. Uh, well, in the 1930s, uh, he ran for state Senate under the socialist ticket. Uh, Naomi Reaches uh, ran for U.S. Congress under that same ticket. And there are all, other, all sorts of other local uh, uh, leftists and liberals who are working together in the 1930s and 1940s to try to build this alternative or sort of evolved environment, political space, if you will where uh, uh, anti-racism becomes an important part of their appeal uh, uh, for power. And while their successes uh, were limited and certainly uh, uh, their electoral success uh, was, was, was uh, uh, nothing particularly spectacular, uh, as we look forward in the 20th century 
uh, for the development of these types of things more earnestly, we can see their roots being sort of uh, spelled out uh, in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, the, the way in which African Americans therefore assessed the possibilities of alliances for their struggle uh, began to not simply open up in the 1930s, but also began to allow them to see or perceive uh, shifting goals. Goals began to move from simply uh, surviving Jim Crow, building those communities that might sustain them to literally pushing against Jim Crow and challenging Jim Crow and, and recognizing some, some return from that, like uh, the uh, desegregation at the University of Maryland and similar sort of opportunities in the fields of education and housing and work that while certainly not the ultimate goal, all the same mark the difference between what they had uh, experienced before. One of the clearest examples of the change in which uh, uh, the 1930s, uh, the New Deal 30s and wartime 40s presented uh, was in the types of protest uh, that, were, uh, that were offered. Uh, we began to see what we would later call direct action and confrontational protest uh, become uh, not simply an occasional uh, development, but more sort of programmatically consistent in the way in which uh, either established groups like the NAACP or the sort of um, purpose-built coalitions and committees which develop from time to time to meet a specific challenge. Uh, uh, during the Depression, for example, uh, in the Black neighborhood uh, along the Pennsylvania Avenue District there in Baltimore, uh, a large majority of the businesses were owned by whites who did not live in that community any longer. Um, uh, because of the need for employment, because of the economic desperation that many African Americans in that neighborhood faced, we began to see protests, economic protests, boycotts, pickets, et cetera, to highlight these differences. And they were joined uh, by uh, others outside of the community. Uh, they were joined by whites uh, as well uh, to put this sort of economic pressure in a very real and demonstrative way uh, to help them uh, challenge their exclusion from employment in their own neighborhoods. Um, we also see uh, the sort of uh, uh, militant, but again, not necessarily radical, you know, militant and radical, uh, although uh, students certainly sometimes confuse the two. Uh, we see uh, African-Americans uh, pragmatically still, but more demonstrably, uh, making claims and making a push for uh, inclusion, uh, making demands on political figures, uh, uh, state government, for example, making uh, demands for shifts in the way in which they interact uh, with police power, for example. Uh, police brutality uh, has an old, long, and sordid tradition in Baltimore. And while uh, protests against police brutality were ever present and consistent, we really began to see them gain a visibility and uh, begin to gain uh, the traction that they would achieve at least uh, uh, early uh, in the 1940s uh, with demonstrations that grew out of the new alliances that were uh, able to be built uh, again in the depression 30s and wartime 40s things that quite simply a generation before uh, would not have been possible We have about 10 to 15 more minutes. I got you. I got you. I'm, I'm, on pace. I'm on pace. I think I should get there just fine. So what uh, develops after the war, however, is seen as a threat to uh, some of that momentum in one, in one regard, but also offers new promise. Um, and that is the advent or the formalization of the Cold War, if you will, between the United States uh, and communist Russia. Uh, if the radical elements like communists and socialists, for example, began to be forced away, if 
uh, the black struggle uh, was threatened by being red baited, by being accused of communist uh, uh, associations and communist sort of inspirations. Uh, the moral ground uh, that the anti-fascist sort of uh, uh, claim against Jim Crow, uh, that remained in place and African-Americans used that uh, as well as the other things that were gained previously, particularly uh, increasing access to the ballot, increasing political strength, uh, certainly again in Southern cities, but also using the uh, inter-regional coalitions that they could build with Blacks and others outside of the South as the great migration began to have its uh, fullest impact and uh, black voting blocks began to emerge as sort of a serious uh, piece to be uh, considered by policymakers. Uh, there's a new visibility that comes into being uh, in the post-war 40s and into the early 50s that uh, shifts the way in which uh, black resistance thinks about its alliances. Uh, uh, the New York Times opens a Southern Bureau for the first time specifically to uh, cover the burgeoning civil rights beat, as it were, in the late 1940s. Uh, the Democrat Party uh, uh, begins to uh, challenge the importance of its conservative wing, particularly its pro-segregation conservative wing, so much so that by the 1940s, uh, late 1940s, by the uh, campaign of Harry Truman, uh, they uh, put a civil rights plank into the party platform at the national convention for the first time. Um, uh, Harry Truman himself becomes the first president in US history uh, to address a gathering of the NAACP when he does so on the mall in Washington in 1947. And there are other ways in which uh, at the federal level from the White House, particularly under Truman in the late 40s, there are every step, I mean, there are steps that are taken that signal to African Americans that the distance, the invisibility that they suffered under, at least from the federal executive, was beginning to shift and therefore new allies might be available, new goals might be, might be uh, identified, new strategies might be put in place in pursuit of those goals. So um, when in 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education is decided and the Supreme Court finally outlaws segregation specifically in education, but as it's understood immediately uh, with ramifications far beyond education. Uh, uh, that was not a surprise per se. Uh, it, it, well, it was a goal that had been set and had been moved toward and, and had been worked toward uh, because of the shifts that, of, of what was possible in just the uh, 40 years uh, since the uh, beginning of um, this, this uh, pursuit of different sort of alliances uh, 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 in response to the Jim Crow environment. Uh, one of the ways in which uh, African Americans expedited that, that pace, as I suggest, uh, was uh, through uh, the, uh, the use of their expanding ballot access, the use of their expanding political force. Uh, to some degree uh, in the South, again, particularly the urban South, but more so outside of the South uh, in the large uh, cities of the Northeast and the Midwest uh, and to create coalitions with those communities to uh, uh, create uh, a voting block that could be tempting and could shift uh, elections, uh, particularly uh, for, for liberal candidates. Uh, but they also did it in more quiet ways. Uh, uh, if Brown in 1954 is the more famous of uh, the Supreme Court's rulings in these years, one that was as impactful, particularly uh, here in Baltimore and elsewhere in the urban South was 1948's Shelley v. Kramer, which uh, uh, made uh, restrictive racial, racially restrictive covenants unenforceable. Now, its, its ultimate power was muted uh, by simple intransience uh, uh, and, and, and local law enforcement's unwillingness to enforce its laws, but its immediate impact was revolutionary all the same. 
and we began to see Blacks in Baltimore, at least, move beyond the traditional uh, footprints in West Baltimore and on the east side and uh, in other areas of the city uh, where, Balt where Blacks had been contained artificially by restrictive covenants and other laws. And by pushing out into these new residential spaces, they made claims to sort of access to corollary spaces. So we began to see recreational areas be tested. We began to see commercial retail areas be tested. We began to see Blacks quietly on an individual uh, basis uh, without much fanfare, applied the pressure that would ultimately uh, bring Jim Crow down, at least in its formal uh, legal structures. We also uh, see uh, uh, through the new visibility and the new authenticity that is given to the Black cause or, or that is uh, assumed by the Black cause in those post-war years um, uh, arise again in this militancy, uh, particularly among young people, uh, Black students at Morgan State, what was Morgan State College at that time, were in many ways the uh, progenitors of what became the student sit-in movement in the 1960s. In the 1950s, Black students uh, at Morgan College, uh, particularly with the uh, commercial and retail establishes, establishments around their university campus, uh, staged sit-ins, organized protests in ways that would be uh, familiar to us uh, looking at the 1960s, but doing this a decade earlier. And, Perhaps another time we might uh, have an, a chance to talk about why Greensboro in 1960 made the splash that Morgan in Baltimore in 1953 did not, uh, but it was not for the actions of the students themselves, but rather their perception and their visibility. But perhaps most importantly for what would come in the 1960s, uh, we see the Cold War environment uh, creating uh, a national effort out of a regional cause and uh, interracialism uh, in terms of alliances and the building of organizations that would execute much of this work. Interracialism gains a new, uh, a new permission, if you will. And we see many of the old uh, organizations that had been around since the 30s and the 40s uh, taking on militant tactics and organizational structures uh, uh, that would uh, re resonate here in Baltimore, but be much more visible as they moved out into the uh, rest of the, uh, the community uh, around the South and across the nation. Uh, the Congress of Racial Equality, which began in Chicago in the 1940s, arrived in Baltimore and other places in the South by the late 40s and early 50s and are working and training and educating in uh, sit-in tactics and uh, nonviolent direct action tactics and in other sort of uh, ways in which uh, the direct action campaigns of the 60s would become famous, but which were again implemented uh, uh, much earlier and uh, which signaled to African-Americans uh, that again, new allies with different sort of orientations uh, were available to uh, help build that struggle and ultimately see that struggle emerge into a movement. Uh, it's also in this time period where we see Black political power uh, here in Baltimore finally translate into electability. Uh, we see some of our first state level Congress people, uh, state level legislators emerge in the late 1950s. The picture of the gentleman in the glasses there, uh, Harry uh, Cole, who becomes the first African American elected to the state legislature when he wins a Senate seat uh, in 1954, uh, largely because not simply African-Americans, but also uh, white allies are, are participating in that type of uh, effort. Um, we see black and white, again, students uh, at the high school level, uh, black and white students, Morgan College, uh, Johns Hopkins University, Goucher College, uh, coming together for uh, direct action campaigns against segregation around the city. Uh, and perhaps most famously, we see multi-generational uh, uh, efforts by Blacks and whites in the city to uh, affect the segregation in the downtown uh, uh, shops and eateries, 
uh, the theaters, Ford Theater is perhaps uh, the most famous uh, example of that. But that momentum continues uh, uh, in from the late 50s and into the 60s. So the notion of the notion of alliances and ally uh, ally building uh, are, uh, has a long history both in the city and throughout the South. And one of the challenges to understanding the history of this time period uh, is to appreciate the ways in which alliances were crucial, not from the point of view of convincing African-Americans to protest, but helping African-Americans to strategize the forms that protest would take and the goals that that protest, uh, those protests would, would establish as they uh, move to uh, battle racial discrimination and particularly uh, its Jim Crow form. So when we see Rosa Parks um, refuse to give up her seat in 1954, uh, again, I've talked about the uh, 1955 rather, uh, I've talked about uh, uh, the need to uh, look even at greater nuance at some aspects of these things. And there's certainly some wonderful new studies of Rosa Parks uh, as an individual that are coming uh, into availability now. But, uh, you know, we, she, doesn't, she doesn't pop there. She doesn't come up there out of thin air. You know, Rosa Parks uh, and Montgomery, Alabama uh, has just as much of a history uh, that I've described for Baltimore. Uh, she comes out of a tradition. Uh, you know, her visibility to those who are unaware begins in 1955, but her record, you know, her, her training, including her exposure to uh, uh, the notion of interracialism and uh, alliances is, you know, stretches uh, 20 years before uh, that fateful moment in December of 1955. Uh, so as we sort of perceive these things, both uh, in Baltimore and the broader South, I think one of the ways in which we can understand uh, these, uh, uh, these developments is to look uh, to the utility they were attempting to sort of uh, serve uh, as uh, African-Americans are strategizing their resistance. And as we look back at them, particularly from the moment of our current circumstance, where once again, we are facing um, uh, uh, sort of these crossroads of, 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 uh, of protests and of racial, uh, seeking racial justice, uh, understanding in some way, shape or form that we've been here before is one of the ways in which uh, history has helped us or help continues to help us in sort of our modern challenges. And uh, quite frankly, there is very little that we have faced, that we face now that we cannot find some lesson, some example from history to help us understand what the way forward uh, may ultimately uh, entail. So we have about five minutes. Oh, thank you, time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you beat me. Okay. Yeah. okay. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, let's uh, open this up for questions. But before we open it for questions, I want to remind folks that we have another discussion uh, of this topic from four to five o'clock today. And the uh, Zoom link is available uh, on the uh, uh, advertisement that went around for Dr. Cherry's talk. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cherry. If there's any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll read them for uh, Dr. Cherry. Uh, let me start off first by asking, uh, what was the population of Baltimore in the 1950s and what per percentage of it was black? I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but I can with some confidence say that between 1950 and 1960, uh, Baltimore got as close as it was going to get to a million people, just under. So of those million people, roughly, uh, uh, somewhere between 20 to 25% were African-American. So you're talking a population of 200, 250,000. And one of the things that's, yeah, one of the things that's interesting about considering population size uh, is uh, assessing the ways in which uh, resistance models could be sort of implemented in one place or another. The Montgomery bus boycott was possible in Montgomery because there were only 40,000 black people. That's not to take anything away from it, but the notion of moving 
200,000 black people, 250,000 black people in lockstep the way they were able to achieve in Montgomery was probably dubious. Uh, Fred Shuttlesworth attempted it in Birmingham, which only had about 150,000 people and he couldn't do it, so. Uh -huh. And today we're about 600,000 in the city and it is majority black, correct? That's my understanding, yes. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, David, I have a question for you. The, you mentioned the west side of Baltimore's NAACP office. I see you smiling. I always have a, a west and an east question. You do. Is that the beginning of kind of the SES split within the African-American community? I mean, that more you know, educated I, people of means yeah. went west? I think the, the best way I can explain it is uh, when the migration to the West Side begins, it begins because, or it has the sort of panache that it has is because it's a new area, you know? Um, until, until Cherry Hill as a project, as, as a, a development project opens in 1946, uh, except for a few privately financed efforts, there had never been, there had never been new homes constructed for black people in uh, Baltimore's history. So when these three and four uh, story uh, brownstones begin to open up in the west side, um, it simply becomes the place to be uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and because of the way in which resistance to expansion in other areas of the city persisted even after the West Side opens, it you know sort of it be, it really became the only outlet uh, uh, for those who were looking for uh, greater spaces and and you know the West Side home housing stock let's say in 1920 uh, was not as old as it was closer to the harbor was not as old as it was in some East Side spaces so uh, even that is a, I think a, an incentive to move there. We have a question here from uh, Dr. Laurie Dean, who is uh, a, a true force and a young sister. Uh, she wants to know, uh, she notes that we otherwise don't get to learn about history. Uh, and in comparing how history informs us now, how do the motivations of allies now versus earlier in history, the same or different? I think um, if I had to uh, venture outside of the timeline of my presentation, I think the uh, the late 50s and the, the civil rights movement, if you will, um, revealed to many communities and, and, and the, ration, the reasons for this vary, how challenged their own status as Americans truly were because um, we see, I don't think, in other words, it is a surprise that the student movement and the new left movement and the second wave feminism all emerge at this time when uh, after the uh, sort of demonstration or example of the way in which uh, the black freedom struggle develops in the 1960s and how it is met uh, uh, sort of plays out. Uh, you see uh, individuals who uh, find those forms of protest very necessary to the fabric of our democracy. And the question of ally and participant, I think perhaps even needs a new definition. Uh, and um, you know, we, we learned that lesson over and over again, it seems, but uh, there are people who are beginning to see the ways in which uh, black protest and American protest, uh, so that they have a sort of seamless relationship uh, uh, the challenges persist and the perceptions persist. There was an excellent uh, uh, essay in The Nation a few weeks ago by Elliot Mistal about, uh, uh, he was lamenting what he believes uh, could be the sort of retreat of, of, of white sources of this summer's protest uh, and, and, and pointing to some histor historical examples of why that may not necessarily be the right thing to do and how we should learn from history. So uh, if you haven't had a chance to uh, read that, I would recommend that. But the idea of um, participating 
as an outsider may need to be reconsidered uh, because it impacts us all. Thank you. I, I want to thank you and I want to thank the uh, almost 100 people who tuned in to see this. And I'm going to end uh, with a comment from Stuart Ray, which I think is really important. Uh, I am reminded of the extent to which this essential history is undertaught and under discussed in our schools and natural discourse. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, David, thank you. You have been wonderful. You've uh, done a number of things for the Kimmel Cancer Center and Johns Hopkins over the last several months. And I truly appreciate it. And I've truly learned to respect history because of you. Uh, folks, have a good day. Yeah, take care.